hometown ghost stories contains serious and often distressing events and is not intended for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Weston, West Virginia, 1951. Day 13. He looked down at the chains. They were starting to cut through the skin on his wrist. He pulled again on them, but it only hurt more. It was useless, he thought. I'm going to die here. He tried to get comfortable, but it was no use. It felt like hours went by. He heard the door open behind him. What is that? Who's there? A cold breeze passed over his shoulder, and one by one, the cuffs on his wrists and ankles let loose. He fell to the ground, unable to get up, shaking. He turned around, expecting to get hit, but nobody was there. The darkness broke as the door crept open just a tiny bit. He tried to get to his feet, but he was too weak. How long had he been here? Days? Weeks? Months? It was all that nurse's fault. She was the one who said he was acting up. He slowly got to his knees and crawled over to the door, opening it just a tiny bit. He peeked through but didn't see anyone. He was naked and needed to find something to wear. He crawled out into the hallway and grabbed the sheet that was sitting folded on a bench. He wrapped it around himself and climbed to his feet slowly. He was so weak. As he rounded the corner, he spotted a nurse walking in the opposite direction. Shit. He quickly dashed back around the corner and stood there for a moment trying not to make any noise. His knees were so weak they were shaking, he was sure they could hear the rattling of his bones from down the hallway. But she was gone now. He turned and made his way for the back staircase. Nobody used this staircase. He'd surely be able to make his way out the back exit and escape, getting away from this hell of an asylum forever. He opened the door to the staircase. Hey, you! Where are you going? He turned around. It was her. That same nurse that had put him in that isolation cell to rot away by himself. He didn't have any time to think about it. He grabbed her by the front collar and pulled her towards him. She stumbled, tripped over the blanket, and went crashing over the balcony down three flights of stairs, smashing to her death. Oh God, what have I done? He rushed as quick as he could down the stairs, but it was no use. She was dead. He slid her body across the floor and underneath the stairs, out of sight. As he looked back, he wondered to himself, how exactly did he get free from those chains? It wasn't a nurse that freed him. It wasn't a doctor. It was something unseen as he made his way into the night. The Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum was authorized to be built in the 1850s, and construction began in 1858, with much of the labor being done by prison laborers. Stonemasons from Germany and Ireland would later be brought in to work on the building. With the Civil War breaking out in 1861, only the central structure, the south wing, and the basement had been completed. The funds for the hospital would be cut off temporarily, and in June of 1861, Weston would be invaded by the 7th Ohio Volunteer Infantry, who would use the unfinished hospital as a camp. Over the next few years, control of the area would change hands a few times, and Weston would end up in the newly formed West Virginia. Construction resumed in 1862, and the hospital would be renamed the West Virginia Hospital for the Insane. In 1864, Confederate raiders stole all of the food and clothing intended for incoming patients. They would admit their first patients in October of the same year. People were admitted to the asylum for a long and outrageous list of reasons. Their first patient was a housewife who was dropped off at the asylum for, quote, domestic trouble. The earliest logbooks showed others who were admitted for grief, seduction, novel reading, congestion of the brain, laziness, masturbation, religious enthusiasm, superstition, alcohol and drug abuse, mental derangement, and the list goes on. Many people who were admitted showed no signs of mental illness at all. At the time, it was the largest hand-cut stone structure in the United States and the second largest in the world next to the Kremlin in Russia. In an effort to remove the stigma caused by the words lunatic and asylum, its name was changed to the Weston State Hospital in 1913. The hospital was largely self-sufficient, growing their own vegetables, 
operating an ice plant and a dairy farm. Fuel for heat was supplied by a nearby coal mine, and it had its own water supply. Clothing, mattresses, blankets, they were all made in town, along with furniture that was made in-house, many times by the mental patients, who were able to learn a trade during their stay. Sitting on 666 acres, the property also had a morgue and a cemetery. The central clock tower was finished in 1871, and the four-story section was designed to house offices and a ballroom. Construction on the building would not be completed until 1881, with the total cost coming in at $725,000. The asylum was just under 1,300 feet long, with over two miles of hallways. By this time, the hospital, which was originally designed to comfortably house 250 inmates, held 717 patients. The number would continue to climb, and by 1950, over 2,600 patients were crammed into the unsanitary, overcrowded rooms and hallways. Overcrowding led to more problems, including neglect and violence. Brutal methods were employed to control some of the more violent patients, including solitary confinement, straitjackets, and lobotomies. Lobotomies were widely used starting in the 1940s. A lobotomy is a form of psychosurgery. The surgery causes most of the connections to and from the prefrontal cortex, the anterior part of the frontal lobes of the brain, to be severed. Electroshock therapy would be administered. Then the sharp tip of the surgical instrument would be inserted at the corner of the eye until it reached the frontal lobes of the brain, sweeping back and forth until the frontal lobes have been disconnected. The results left patients confused and disoriented, and in many cases seemed to turn the patient into a personalityless, walking corpse. Over 20,000 lobotomies had been performed in the United States. Over 3,500 of those were performed at the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. 74% of all lobotomies were performed on women. As patients continued to flow into the asylum, conditions worsened and abuse skyrocketed. Some were kept in cages, while others were chained to walls. They were kept naked in these rooms for weeks, sometimes months, even through the winter, without proper heat. Many suffered at the hands of doctors and scientists who continued to experiment with barbaric methods in attempts to cure them of their mental illnesses. Bloodletting, insulin coma therapy, along with electroshock therapy were used. When all else failed, thousands would be lobotomized. In 1935, a tuberculosis building was added to house the sick. In 1949, the Charleston Gazette would expose the asylum for its poor conditions, including insufficient lighting, heating, and a lack of furniture. The darkest days of the asylum were in the 1950s, when the population peaked around 2,600 patients, about 10 times the intended capacity. They were understaffed and massively overcrowded. This led to an uptick in patients being subjected to solitary confinement. This was also the time when the favored method of healing was the transorbital lobotomy, also known as the ice pick lobotomy. This type of procedure was done with a one or two prong device, which was driven through the orbital socket of the eye with one sharp blow. Many times, a hammer would be used to slam the pick through the eye socket, sweeping back and forth in the frontal lobe, causing permanent brain damage to the patient. Now this permanent damage would relieve the patient of some of their more severe symptoms, but it would also render them a shell of their former self, many having to learn basic motor functions over again, like walking, eating, and talking. Many did not survive the procedure. In 1952, Dr. Walter Freeman performed 228 lobotomies in a two-week span, donning it Operation Ice Pick. He would then travel around in his lobotomobile, performing ice pick lobotomies for $200 apiece. Operation Ice Pick took place at the Weston State Hospital. Violence and abuse at the asylum was widespread and was not only coming from the staff. Patients began to turn on each other. With a lack of employees, it was impossible to keep an eye on so many patients at the same time. Many would remain in their rooms for days or weeks without being checked in on. Suicides, rapes, and murders among the patients were on the rise. One patient was reportedly stabbed several times and died while crawling across the floor to the nurse's station. One of the more brutal murders took place in a patient room where three men were staying. Two men accused the other one of, quote, stealing their oxygen and attempted to hang him with his bed sheets. After hoisting him up several times, they realized it wasn't working. They forced him to the ground, placed the metal bed frame on the side of his head, and then proceeded to jump on the bed over and over until his skull was crushed. Several female nurses were raped. Many went missing, with at least one being murdered. One night, she went missing, and many just assumed she quit. 
Her badly decomposed body was discovered months later, hidden under an unused staircase. In 1985, Brian Scott B., a patient, committed suicide, and his body was not discovered for eight days. George Edward Bodie was killed during a fight with another patient. That same year, the Charleston Gazette again wrote a glaring piece on the asylum, reporting that court-appointed inspectors found the building to be dirty and unkempt. They discovered patients who were left naked and confined to dirty wards with bathrooms smeared with feces. In 1992, the Charleston Gazette would strike again, writing about the horrendous conditions inside the building. With public outcry from the community and an onslaught of bad press from the media, they were forced to close their doors in 1994. The building stood vacant for over a decade and was eventually auctioned off to Joe Jordan, who purchased the property for $1.5 million. He would restore parts of the building, opening a museum and hosting paranormal tours. In a controversial move, Jordan chose to use the original name of the building, the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. With years of tormented patients being trapped within these walls, it's no mystery why the asylum is infested with ghosts. Over 2,000 people are buried on the grounds, most in unmarked graves. Hauntings on the property began before construction on the hospital was even completed. Some workers would only stay a few days, being scared off by unexplained noises and eerie sightings. Ex-patients, doctors, nurses, children, and even Civil War-era soldiers all saw horrific events at this place, and now they're forced to relive these tragic events for an eternity. In the Civil War wing, the spirit of a former patient named Ruth is said to lurk. Ruth hated men, and she would attack any man that came near her, throwing things at them, or pushing them. Today, Ruth's ghost is said to be responsible for pushing men against walls and making whistling sounds in the hallways. On the second floor in Ward 2, several violent events occurred. This was the site where a man was stabbed 17 times before dying on his way to get help. On the same floor, two patients hang themselves from curtain rods, committing suicide together. Their shadow figures have been seen on several occasions, levitating above the ground, swaying back and forth. EVPs have also been captured in these rooms, demanding that the intruders get out. On the third floor, where one of the most gruesome murders occurred, the ghost of a man who had his head crushed by a bed frame is said to still haunt the room where he died. A nurse named Elizabeth also lurks on this floor, as well as another ghost who has been nicknamed Big Jim. Doors are said to open and close by themselves on this floor, and sightings of elusive apparitions and shadow figures have been reported. The most well-documented spirit remains on the fourth floor. Lily is believed to be a little girl who spent her entire short life inside the asylum. Her mother was committed while pregnant and died while giving birth. Lily would spend her entire life never leaving the asylum and tragically pass away at nine years old from pneumonia. The ghost of Lily still waits in her room, surrounded by toys, sitting patiently, waiting for someone to come play with her. She's said to wear a white dress and has a favorite music box. She will sometimes turn the music box on by herself and move toys around the room. Many have also seen the spirit of a soldier on the fourth floor named Jacob. His ghost is said to walk the hallways. Hysterical laughter has been heard echoing from empty rooms, and blood-curdling screams bellow from the electro-shock room. But something more sinister is said to lurk on the fourth floor. An apparition called the Creeper has been reported by several people to crawl along the floor, slamming doors along its path as the sound of its ominous breathing gets louder and louder. The Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum is ranked the number one haunted area in West Virginia. Many of the horrors and torture that took place on this property will never be fully revealed. Those secrets lie with the tormented souls that still walk these halls today. I'm Jesse Wilkins, and this is Hometown Ghost Stories, Weston, West Virginia, the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum.
What's up, folks, and welcome into Hometown Ghost Stories, episode number 29. I'm Jesse Wilkins. I'm joined by Rob Coakley. Hello, Rob. All right, and, and introduce Dave. I have to talk about something. And Dave. Uh, what's up? All right, enough of the formalities. The Lobotomobile? That's what he <laughs> called his car? Yeah, he, did, he actually he called it that. Yeah, that wasn't me being silly. Like, he coined that term. Well, he was he... like, I'm just... Absolute fucking super villain. <laughs> the Lobotomobile. Like, can you? Okay, so let's. I want you to picture this, right? It's what? What year was this? Like 1920, 30, 70, 60, whatever it was. All that. Yeah. So you're in the town square and you're just chilling. And all of a sudden, this dude comes by with like a siren or something and just a megaphone. So it's like, um, and then it's like, Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we have the doctor in the Lobotomobile. Come see us at the town mall. Like, what is happening right now? It was like a circus act. He was doing he was yeah. doing these lobotomies. For, I, I think it was like 100 or 200 bucks a whack, and he would just... 25. No pun intended. He was... Uh, you said you got $25? 25 US dollars, which at the time was... was more, well, it's more now. You know what I mean? Of course. Yeah. Uh, I, I had heard a few different... I heard 100 and 200. I hadn't heard 25, but I believe it. Uh, but yeah, he'd cruise around in his Lobotomobile and do multiple. And I guess he would do these in a matter of minutes. And it was like a it was like a circus act. Like I said, he would be there was one time, I guess, where he was doing two of them at the same time. It's like, dude, you're just you're giving these people permanent brain damage <laughs> as like a, a fun show. Come enjoy the show. They did so yeah. much of this. And it was like, you know, they at the time they didn't realize it. But like in retrospect, it was like a huge problem because they were just destroying people's brains. They yeah. started it because they would, they started it, they started out doing it on dogs, like dogs that were super aggressive. They tried this out and it was like, oh my God, it worked. The dog went from a super aggressive dog. Now it's a nice, calm, docile dog. But what they don't understand was you can't tell that now the dog is brain damaged. You just think he's a calm dog. Once you do it on people, um, <laughs> Dave sucks tattoo. Uh, once you do it on people, now they have a great um, example is One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest with Jack Nicholson. They lobotomized him in that movie. Mm -hmm. And he was just a vegetable, pretty much. Like Jesse said, basically a walking corpse. There was um, there was one event that actually happened in, I think it was the 1940s, where they had two of the most prolific lobotomists. They basically faced off um, against each other in the operating theater. It was at the Institute of the Living in Hartford, Connecticut. And they performed before an audience of like 30 neurosurgeons, neurologists, psychiatrists, and they each had their own techniques and they each had a turn on stage. So it started out with William Beecher Scoville, who was the professor of neurology at Yale. He went first and his method was his, they wheeled his patient out and she was subdued from, I think, electroshock therapy. And he basically lacerated her above her eyebrows and peeled down the skin of her forehead and drilled two holes oh, above yeah. each eye. And then use like a little spatula thing to lift up the frontal lobe and the little vacuum to suck like whatever part out that makes it lobotomized. He was so fancy. I know. So they uh, <laughs> that was his method, and he was like, "See, it's great." So they wheeled out his patient, and then they was he spinning in. a basketball on the other hand too? <laughs> I know. Like, what is that? Were they <laughs> no, coming his... out to entrance music like this is a wrestling event? Like, what is that? <laughs> I know. Like, this I'm is literally how they did it, though. It was a competition. American. <laughs> and the second uh, competitor was, um, was uh, what's his name? Freeman there. Yep. And um, his patient was wheeled out. And that's when he did the, um, the um, what do you call it? The ice pick method. And it was mm -hmm. basically for, mm -hmm. he's trying to like introduce like an assembly line approach to the procedure. You know, he's basically like the Henry Ford of lobotomies. So he did, he demonstrated the ice pick thing and it was way faster and he won. Stone Cold Steve Austin music hit. He pulls down the ramp in his lobotomobile, jumps out <laughs> with his ice pick. <clears throat> it was a ridiculous. He performs an ice pick on a lucky fan along the way down the ramp. <laughs> Knocked it out. <laughs> what is happening? Like this is this is bananas. It's... Like people and people were just cool with it. People were just like, yeah, I'm, I'm so yeah, glad you offering, stuck yeah, something like, in his eyeball. It, it was serious. I mean, we're laughing about it. It was crazy. But I, I'm trying not to use the word crazy in this episode, but it's, we just throw that out the window. It's not going to happen. No, this I'm going to keep saying it. But they had, they, people would just bring their kids in. Like if their kid had ADHD, they'd be like, okay, let me come get a uh, a lobotomy. And, and they bring him in. And this guy was winning awards for his work. And at the end of the day, he ruined so many people's lives. A lot of people didn't even survive the procedure. And, and as people that were watching on YouTube, you could see the footage. It was graphic. 
You can see why literally jamming an ice pick through this eye, through this person's eye socket with a with a hammer, just bat, 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 just right into the skull and then just twisting it back and forth. It's disgusting. Oh, I like it. Absolutely disgusting. And I was cringing putting this episode together. You were and, cringing? I was telling you how much I hated you in the private chat yeah, while I was watching yeah. it. I should have put out, I should have put out like a separate disclaimer for people that don't want to see it because I did notice once that once that video started playing, we dropped a few viewers. I think people might have tuned out because it was freaking gross. I, but, I was like... <laughs> but real quick, before we, before we go super far into this episode, I want to thank a few people that are hanging out in chat. Uh, I see Casher here. Kate's here. Uh, Fox Crown is back. Good to see you back, buddy. Uh, Steve Moore is here. He says he's been there a few times. Steve, if you want to drop a little bit of info on uh, what you have seen in your visits, we'd love to love to Were pick, your, visits or we'd love to pick your brain on that one. Oh, no. And uh, <laughs> this was your best. Well. I was just about to praise you and tell you this was your scariest <laughs> episode you've done. I was actually like, Sue, I was, I love all your episodes, but this one particularly was scary as hell. And then you do that and I'm just, sorry. I apologize and I just apologize. ruin it for everybody. But yes, uh, with the bit, with the big intro, I, I do want to welcome you guys and, and thank you for hanging out in the live chat. For those of you who are listening on the podcast, if you do want to join in the live chat every Tuesday night, 9 PM Eastern standard time, uh, we're live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch. And if you want to support the show, make sure you guys swing over to iTunes, drop a five-star review and leave a comment. Now, before we go further into lobotomies and all of this, um, all of the things that were happening at this hospital, because there's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on. I want to get into the reasons that people were brought into this hospital because yeah. this list is, it, it's scary because it's real, but it's like comedy. It's, what do you do in West Virginia? What was it? What, I mean, like. I, I told you some of my stories about going to West Virginia a, a few years ago, and uh, I guess I get it. West Virginia. What are we doing? It's, uh, clearly. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me share this. Let me share this image for people that are watching. Hang on one sec. Boom, so boom. the one that while well, you're pulling this up, the one that I sent to you was what was it? It was snuff snuff. What was it? Where is it? It's uh, snuff, snuff eating, eating for two years. For two years. What 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 is happening? <laughs> I think it just means eating a lot, right? Well, no, snuff was a thing, right? Snuff was um fighting fire. Yep. So Andrew <laughs> Andrew's done. Throw him away. All right. Uh let's let's go through this list for people that are listening. Um kicked in the head by a horse. <laughs> I mean, okay, maybe man. that would yeah, 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 I could see that. Be actually one of the more, All right. More this reasons. one. So let let let's go back in and just clarify a few things. At the time, this was a rough time for women. This was women will get thrown in this hospital for a, th this long list of reasons. You're going to see how many of these are kind of sexist and just geared towards get the wife out of the house and let the girlfriend come over or something, whatever, whatever the motive was. But these are these that this list is 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 wild. So uh, kicking that by the horse, uh, ill treatment by husband. Yeah. <laughs> so. If you're abusing your wife, then you just go drop her off at the mental asylum. Like, I don't know what's wrong with her. I've just been treating her poorly. Please I take her. I can't stop reading deranged masturbation. And yep. like, oh, there's a few masturbation ones. And um, now we have to start a band called Deranged Masturbation. Definitely, or... hard, yeah, like a hardcore <laughs> um, death metal, if you will. Yeah. Uh, imaginary female trouble. So for all you incels out there, <laughs> God. <laughs> Yeah, it's my girlfriend, you know. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, yeah, anyways, um, this is my favorite. Uh, marriage of son. So if you accidentally married your son, yeah, that's I could see that one for sure. Uh, hysterical, immoral life. So, all right, just mm -hmm. lock me up. Imprisonment, yeah. lock me up twice. Wait, imprisonment. So what do they take him out of jail and put him in the middle of something? <laughs> no, I think <laughs> I that they would... I think imprisonment means they would use imprisonment. They would they would imprison you there. So like if you were going to imprison somebody, or maybe somebody who was crazy, okay, or committed a um, a crime that could be, um, you know, they did it because they're crazy, then they could be sent there instead of prison. That's what I think. All right, all right, all right. The next one if, I feel like should be broken into two categories. Sorry, go ahead, Rob. If your parents were cousins, like that's your fault. Like you get thrown into into it for that. Oh my God! There, it's down some. It oh, says oh, parents oh, were cousins. Oh, it goes on. Um, yeah, 
jealousy and religion. Now, these are like two <laughs> very different things. But this shouldn't what? be on the list. The one of them one is... just says the war. <laughs> yeah, what's, what's that one? What? Just the war. The war. Uh, we have laziness, <laughs> uh, masturbation, and syphilis. That does sound like a uh, a absolute miserable combination. Uh, this is my absolute favorite: is masturbation for thirty years. Yeah, you know, I got to know if that's like there. thirty years <laughs> straight. <laughs> We've, We've all, all been, been there, yeah. yeah. Majority of my life, uh, it has to be right. <laughs> You're supposed to call a doctor if it lasts longer than four hours. Never mind, thirty years. Yeah, thirty years, you just go straight to the insane asylum. Uh, medicine to prevent conception. So if you're just on birth control, I guess, straight to the insane asylum. Uh, menstrual deranged, I guess that means if she's a little extra crazy during that time of the month. Uh, mental excitement. Uh, maybe that's like an ADHD thing. My uh, this one is a uh, this one is obviously uh, warranted. Novel reading. Yeah, can't do that. Yeah, still no, can't she's, do that she's the reading books. Still can't do that in West Virginia. You still Must get locked up. <laughs> I'm gonna get us canceled in that state. Uh, nymphomania. Okay. Um, opium Se habit. Seduction and disappointment. So, like, <laughs> I love how they're together. <laughs> it's like, <sighs> I finally seduced him, but mm -hmm. I was extremely disappointed. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so oh, yep. We we got to stop reading this because no no gotta... no it's so much fun uh, overstudy of religion <laughs> so just lock up every priest overtaxing and mental power uh, overtaxing mental powers what I don't know what that means uh, parents were cousins means, goodbye uh, periodical fits tobacco and masturbation <laughs> another one that's like how do these things go hand in hand but yeah I guess if you uh, I don't know if you smoke while masturbating you're gone political excitement so everyone in America gets locked up today politics in general. Just politics. Gone. Uh, religious enthusiasm. I feel like we covered that one earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, fits and desertion of husband. So if you a skipped, woman... You skipped right over fever and loss of lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> what, like, the combinations are so weird. <laughs> that is so strange. Like, God, I had a fever and then I've lost my court case. <laughs> yeah. It's just... What is right. gathering in the head? That is just one sentence. It says gathering in the head. And that's just when you're thinking about the the gathering of the juggalos too much. And it's just all in your head. <laughs> I, and I guess so. Insane sound. Bad company. So uh, bad company. Buy bad company on the album. Bad company. <laughs> the best one here is bad whiskey. Yeah. I mean, that's fair. So just lo lock my grandfather, may he rest in peace, up for just drinking uh, doers because that was pretty bad whiskey. Um, bloody women trouble. Women trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Lock up 90% of my friends. Uh, brain fever, business nerves, carbonic acid gas. Death of sons in war. I mean, well, I guess that could be I drive guess, you yeah. Crazy, if, if you're, but, yeah, it could be depressed. Um, um, decoyed into the army. Deranged masturbation. That sounds wild. YouTube, weekly YouTube streaming. <laughs> the Fox Ground says also weekly YouTube streaming, which is true. <laughs> I mean, you just go through this list and we're getting locked up for like 14 of these already. Um, yeah. Desertion by husband. So if the husband yeah. divorces okay. her. Poor lady. He's just going to he's going to lock her up. Uh, we should probably skip over the rest of this list. Any, yeah. any other great ones that you want to touch on so we can move on from here? Oh, the best one. The best one. Shooting of daughter. Yeah, fair. fair. Yeah. Smallpox not feeding for two years. Oddly um, specific. Very specific. All right. Um, just I Salvation move... Army. Hang on. Just Salvation Army is a reason. <laughs> you won't stop ringing the bell. <laughs> <laughs> Fell from horse in war. Anyways, we can move All on. All right. I want to read this comment before we get into more stuff because Stephen Moore was, um, was a, is a viewer that has been there. He says that he's witnessed smoke, smoke smells, then was told that it was a nurse's station and they would give Patient cigarettes there, seen a footprint that looked wet on the fourth floor. Also witnessed a flashlight going on and off on command. I think that was on the fourth floor also. And also had the feeling of being watched while there, which creepy. is creepy. Yep. Um, he also Spirit. visited while it was still in operation when his cousin was a deputy sheriff and he would ride with him to take or pick up patients to be evaluated or to stand trial. Did, I, I wonder, Steve, did you go in at all when it was in operation? Because I'd be interesting to uh, 
to hear yeah. what that was like. So he visited sure. while it was still in operation as customer. Yeah, but I, I'm wondering I'm wondering if he went in and they were saying they just picked people up. A little so, more details and that would be phenomenal. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah. So the thing with, with these um asylums is they're almost like did you guys ever play the Fallout series of video games? So this might be like a whole inside thing. Yeah. So basically in this gaming universe, you would go into these different vaults where people were like locked down during nuclear war and each one did like a different weird experiment. And that's kind of what these lunatic asylums, like each lunatic asylum in the country had like these different freaking weird experiments they would conduct on the patients. And this one's which... specialty is lobotomies. One of the fallouts was based on this exact place. Oh, was it really? Yeah. yeah. On, I didn't on this know that exact, when I brought it up. Um, asylum. Yeah. I don't know which one it was, but it was was based on this particular one. Oh, that's crazy. But yeah, so that's like, so that it's just the th thing I've noticed because I'm looking into an insane asylum right now and it's completely different than, than this one, even though you would think like there should be some standard across the board. And uh, yeah, so I found it's super interesting that like, it has this very spe specific niche. I mean, obviously they were doing other things as well, but you laid out the fact that they did about three to 4% of, or more of the entire country's lobotomies, mm -hmm. which doesn't sound like a lot until you really break it down on the, Look numbers. At the actual numbers. Yeah. That's bananas. That's like crazy amounts of, yeah, I think actually, it was like 2,500 or 3,500 that were done. Yeah, I actually think it was a bigger percentage. I think I it remember. was, yeah. In in America, yeah, because there was 20,000 yeah. in the United States. 3,500 would be a pretty decent amount. But there, yeah, this so was, like there was much, yeah, much more that was done over, I think, uh, in Europe. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's one of the things that I found super interesting about this story, as well as, like, all the different horrible things that happened. I can't even remember them all. You, like, went through, like, a hundred things that were just frighteningly terrible about just, this place. Yeah, the list goes on and on and on 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 why this place is haunted. I mean, so you could deal with you could take any aspect of it. Obviously, you start with the patients. A lot of patients were tortured, tormented. They were kept in not only just cages like I showed on the screen, which was kind of like a stand up cage, but I guess they had this thing that they called like a crib, basically, where they'd lock you in this cage. You'd be laying down. You'd have the cage right in front of you. You couldn't even sit up in this thing. And they would just keep them in there for weeks or whatever. And it was absolutely just torture. And you got to think about what these people are going through. And, and when you look at that list and not to, we're not going to go back over the list, but you had people that were clearly not mentally unstable when they went in, just mm -hmm. people who maybe had a drinking problem, people that um, maybe just were chronic masturbators or whatever. But you had people like that, that were, that were going in there and the conditions were so poor that they probably did lose their minds while they were inside there, yeah. whether they were being tortured or just neglected, they were subject to other people around them that were being violent. And they were so understaffed, especially once you hit like the 1950s that they wouldn't check in on certain patients for weeks. The guy committed they had, suicide. They didn't find him for eight weeks. There was a max capacity for 260 people. That's what it was when they built it. And by the time it hit the peak, in the 1950s, I think it was, you said they had 2,600 patients there, mm -hmm. which is 10 times <laughs> the yeah, capacity. So it was that. And then it's it, the population just starts to decline towards like it was the literally 80s. 10 times. Right. Uh, so I, I don't know if I would say it. So they use this, um, this method that was a lot like, there's a lot of similarities with Waverly. They even had their own tuberculosis wing, but they had, they were trying to do this open air kind of situation. It was supposed to be very spacious. Every patient was supposed to have their own room. The walls were supposed to be extra thick so that if someone was screaming or having a terrible time, the other patients wouldn't be disturbed. Now, this ended up hurting them in the long run because patients were murdering each other and no one heard the murder because the walls were so thick. So that did not go well. Um, but I think square footage wise, this place was big enough to house more than 240 people, probably a lot more, which is why they got away with it for a while. And it was good for the economy, which it sounds like it wouldn't be like you have this asylum, but they were, it brought a lot of stuff to town. So they were producing, uh, I mean, they had plenty of jobs 
they probably should have had more jobs because more <laughs> people were in there, but they had plenty of people that were getting work. They, I mean, you're going for over a hundred years. So they worked through the great depression, everything. And the whole city of Weston or the town of Weston thrived and, um, and did really well while the hospital was there. So that's probably why it lasted as long as it did. And then eventually as the demand or the need for beds for mental patients went down as medicine kind of evolved, then you saw them kind of turn their back on the, the reason the for institutionalizing people became a little bit more stringent too, rather than the really loose um, set of reasons that we listed off earlier. So well, the, the further we got into the future, the right. um, the fewer ridiculous reasons. Yeah, and that list of ridiculous the, reasons was probably the reason that it became so overpopulated because you're literally putting people in there for any reason that you could come up with. Yeah, and there was a big public backlash in like the 70s and 80s on places like this after um, people went in with like movie cameras, not to this specific one, but the one that I'm thinking of, I can't remember off the top of my head. And they just showed the conditions in these places. And there was like a public outcry to close like all of them. And then they found that most of them were overpopulated like this. And there was terrible conditions. The doctors didn't care. Or if they, even if they did care, how much care can you show when you're literally 10, 20 times what the maximum occupancy is supposed to be in these places. Like you can't do much, right? Like, like it's just, it's not set up to help these people at that point. It's set up to hide them. Yeah, is, basically. Is the problem. Yeah. So. And like Jesse was saying that they probably, probably create, cause people who are not insane to go insane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's just, it's, it's always wild to think of like the human evolution of stuff like this, where, it was a circus performance to perform operations in front of people, basically. Like it was something you would take, you know, your family to, like you were saying, and just go watch these people. Let's go see how they're doing lobotomies this week, Timmy and Jimmy. And uh, maybe you'll be a doctor one day. A fun family night out. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, yeah, I, I found a lot of the ghost stories in this terrifying as well. Absolutely. The yeah, creeper should... is I... one of the scariest sounding ghosts I think that we've mentioned. Because hmm. we uh, all of our ghosts that we talk about sound dumb. <laughs> big was it Big Jim one of them? <laughs> yeah, Big Jim. Was the, what was the one? There are no the details guy? on Big Jim. I know. <laughs> oh, you're talking about just by name. Just, just by name. Yeah. Just, okay. I was yeah. like, I was like, you're no, really no, no, just no. Yeah, throwing yeah, the yeah. show under the bus right now. <laughs> no, no, no. I was talking about like, what, what was the one at um. The Whispers Estate, the one in the attic there that was just, what the heck was the oh, name of that yeah, one? You're right. There was, um, no, they had one, I think, on like first, boots. No, it, was, it was on Boots. There was, yeah, Boots ones. No, the, at the Whispers There's Estate, like there was Boots ones. We've had like 14 ghost named Boots. Mr. Yep. Boots. That's what it was. At the uh, Whispers like Estate, there was uh, Big Black. That was the name they came up with for <laughs> yeah. the, the Big Black uh, ghost that would float around the first one. Not a great name. Yeah, you have Big Jim at this one. There was no details on Big Jim, but I had to include it as that was one of the ones. Like, well, Big Jim's up there. Just what about him? How'd you find out it was Big Jim? <laughs> yeah. But those are the details we have. Maybe someone has more details on Big Jim. I thought Big Jim had to do with something with uh, Joe, which was allegedly the name of the murderer who was there. And I guess he murdered a few people um, inside the asylum, but he was the one that put the bedpost on that guy's head and stomped on or jumped on the bed to crush his skull. So, that happened in 1987. That wasn't even that long ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was alive. Yeah, barely, but I was alive. I'm sure you're healthy and well. Meh. The base just barely Story hanging person. on at age three. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's already over it. I was already. Like, oh, I'm so sick of this. Um, but no, it's that the bed frame thing. Why is how is that your go to? How is that something you? come up with in the moment well, they they tried yeah, hanging limited options times. and i guess they just kept hoisting them up and down on they, they had like wrapped the bed sheet around the uh i don't know a pipe or something and they they just were trying to hoist him up he just wouldn't die I'm like all right screw it put these metal bed frame on the side of his head i'm just gonna say if you have violent mental patients you should probably bolt down the bed or separate because that them. sounds like a dangerous weapon hmm uh, yeah, I don't know. So that that was a, a brutal way to go, and I guess the guy that died was a really nice guy, which is unfortunate for him. It was, and uh, the reason that they gave him was you, he was stealing their oxygen. Ridiculous! Sorry. 
went ridiculous. <laughs> I'll, I'll stop. Yeah. Um, there was a um, there was a medium that went to go investigate because they do invest uh, ghost investigations now, and there was a medium, and they were in that room, and allegedly the medium didn't know anything about the patient. Believe it, or if you will, but um, she had said that she she sent she detected a uh, presence and that he was in a benevolent spirit, but he he was in a benevolent and an intelligent spirit, but was unable to communicate, and she didn't know why she couldn't understand. Uh, and then they were like, "Oh, maybe because in real life he was a mute, he couldn't talk." Oh, so that, oh. that was pretty interesting that she was able to figure all that out, but not figure it out. That was the one that got his head. Yeah, he head. was allegedly a mute in real oh. life. Damn, that must That's have been terrible. Heard. One of the only things he can do is steal oxygen, and they they killed him for it. That's brutal. That is brutal. Um, and then the other death, there was a guy who was stabbed seventeen times, and then he died while crawling across the floor to the nurse's station to get help. So that is uh, that is absolutely brutal. Andrew says maybe he was mute because he got his head crushed. <laughs> uh, yeah. That'll do it. It didn't help. Yep. And then you had uh, the nurse who went missing. We alluded to that one earlier. Uh, they just straight up lost her for months. And then her body was found underneath the staircase. And that just goes to show you how bad did that place smell that you didn't notice the scent of a decaying body at the bottom of a staircase inside the building for months. Yeah. And it shows that it's not getting clean. Oh, of like, course not. Yeah. Yeah. Like you don't have a cleaning staff on hand or something like places of this building are just not even being accessible to, to, to foot traffic. Mm -hmm. What do we, what is happening here? So, yeah, I mean, there, there probably should have been a deeper investigation by the eighties, at least the seventies, the eighties, we couldn't get this under control. We took another 20 years. Come on. It's just, they never it, got under control. They shut it down in the nineties. That's yeah, my point. Just, yeah. Yeah. It, the it fact took that that long though, I think on the second visit that the the Charleston Gazette reported on, that was when they had sent in court appointed inspectors, and the fact that court and court ordered inspectors went in there and they're like, yeah, place is really bad, really unsanitary. There's naked patients chained to walls. That they didn't shut it down then and there. And then it wasn't until like the community was like, we've had enough, and there was like public outcry. But at that point, like I said, they they didn't house as many patients as they used to in the fifties. That was the height of it. And, you know, by the late eighties, early nineties, medicine had become kind of the replacement for mental asylums, which is why you don't really have too many of those anymore. So medicine, you know, different kind of, um, benzodiazepines and different kind of, uh, psychotic drugs. Those have replaced the mental institutions. So now these people are more stable. Some of them. And it was Thorazine that replaced the lobotomy. Thorazine. That's what I read, which is good. That's definitely a step in the right direction. I would hope so. <laughs> yeah, it's I definitely... mean, anything is a step in the right direction from what was going on here, right? Yeah. I, mean... I think they still do lobotomies to, uh, they don't do them with an ice pick, but they do them for different reasons. Like a, a much, um, a way, like way more scaled down version of the lobotomy. And they do it for, I think, for some like schizophrenia and stuff like that. Mm. But they're not like, Jam and ice picks in people's eyes anymore, which is nice. That's nice. Just because I don't want to, I don't want to have to see that again. That was uh, some ugly footage. Yeah, some ugly footage. Thanks. So some of the other, the most prominent ghost is Lily, who was supposed to be that four-year-old girl. Wasn't she? This nine? is uh, oh, a nine-year-old girl. I'm sorry, but um, I believe this one is all based off legend and psychics and people who are doing that. I don't think there's any documentation documentation on Lily existing. So this one's all just. Do I think really they believe like it was there's documentation on one woman who was um this during or right after the civil war I think and she was attacked by a group of rogue soldiers and they brought her in pregnant from the attack and she had the baby and she died I think right after childbirth and then the the baby was the 9 year you know lived there for 9 years that's what I had heard about it Okay. Yeah. I had read if there's, there's been a few accounts of people that were born and died inside the asylum. So that wasn't the only one that was, um, pregnant, gave birth in there. It's, it's wild that they don't put the baby into some sort of foster care while their mother is in this insane asylum and they just keep the baby there or just well, a tree civil, somewhere would be better. Like war. anything. Yeah. Just let her, let her go. Like, yeah. <laughs> figure it out. You're better <laughs> off. Open the door. Free now. <laughs> you must survive. 
odds are probably better doing that. So, um, my no- my nephew's in a mental home right now. No, I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm saying they're they're not the answer anymore. So that there's some, plenty of people that need kind of mental care and they need to get straightened out. There's also an alternative to going to prison. Is is you know you plead insanity. They do put you in the, in those. There's one uh, there's one down the street. There's one in Pembroke. So yeah, my, there's uh, insta- there's my grandfather's mental wife hospitals in now. They're not the same thing as mental asylums. It's not. Right. It's not the same thing. They don't and have I'm, mental asylums yeah. anymore. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, there's one in Bridgewater. It's just, it's better regulated. They, if you're going there, it's legitimately to get help probably 95% of the time now. And I believe As most opposed... of the time you have the option to check out whenever you want. Right. I'm yeah. sure that there's certain scenarios where, you know, if someone's, if there's an insane murderer that's inside an asylum, they're not going to be like, oh, well, he wants to go. Let him go. <laughs> Time there's to probably, leave. There's probably yeah. certain situations where they uh, they fix that. But uh, Stephanie asked, uh, um, but wasn't the thought that if the mother was so called insane that the child would be too? I would assume so. I mean, uh, if they're yeah. if they're admitting everyone for every single one of these ailments or whatever to and saying that they're all insane, then that would one hundred percent. They believe it was hereditary. If, yeah, you, if you sure. could get it, if you could be insane for reading books, then yes, definitely hereditary. Mm, mm-hmm. SNS Falcon, welcome to the stream. I think this is your first time here on the podcast, but welcome in, buddy. So, uh, yeah, so we, we had mentioned Lily. She So she has her music box, and I guess that sometimes they'll turn on that music box by itself. Toys will move around that room, and there's a few other things that she'll do. She's been heard laughing. She's been heard crying. So it's one of the more active. I think it is the most active spirit inside the uh inside the asylum so that's the one that people get the most activity from and i was watching i i used a couple clips from from these guys videos cash was mentioned earlier it's like more adventures or something like that um they spent almost the entire night inside that room uh to a flaw which i was like why why won't they leave here there's so much more to look at but uh so you're able to still go to this place yes yeah so the uh, ghost tours Yep, they do ghost tours. You can book it uh, like a lot of other locations where you can book it as um, for a paranormal tour. You can do, uh, they do flashlight tours and people get a lot of results. I've heard some really cool EVPs come out of here. Um, uh, Most famously, there's one room where they'll tell you to get out and it's been captured multiple times. And there's a a lot of stuff that people have caught. You see orbs and all that kind of stuff. And a couple of, I, I forgot to include it. I had a pretty good image of a ghost. I'm not going to dig it up right now that somebody caught, but it was on the internet. So, um, must be real. Uh, I think they may have gotten funds per patient. I think that that's, um, yeah, that's definitely a possibility. And I know it was state funded in the beginning. And so I, I would assume that's, that's how it goes. You practice for real life by playing phasmophobia. Yes. And if you did notice in the video, Actually, some of the footage from my video was actual phasmophobia gameplay because I didn't have much for the opening story. I heavily edited it, so I'm I'm hoping that a lot of people didn't notice, or if you did, if you play phasmophobia, some of the footage, they actually have an asylum map. I like how he spends all this time editing it so people don't notice, then tells them the same episode. I I hope you didn't (laughs) notice this thing that that I'm going to tell you about right now. Well, now they're going to go back and watch it a second time. Uh, (laughs) The the funny thing about that is... um, that game is uh, very scary if you play it by yourself. And I was horrified because basically it's a ghost hunting game for people that haven't played. And I was, I don't like playing it solo. If you play with a group, it's fun. It's not that scary, but I had to load into the game. It's a giant map. It's an, it's an asylum, a haunted asylum. There's ghosts lurking in there and they'll find you. So you only have a certain amount of time to get what you need to get done before the ghost starts hunting you. And it gets really scary, especially if you're playing by yourself. And in this building, I had to make my way down to the basement to go turn the power on, make my way back up <laughs> to go find the nurse's station because I wanted to get the footage approaching the nursing station. I also had to get footage like inside a room. I was so scared. I was so scared. And I'm sitting there just like freaking out. The wife's in the other room. She's like, why are you playing this in the middle of the day? I'm like, I'm not doing this by myself at night. So I was pretty horrified. But that was um, that was my experience. Um, it is a great game, Stephanie, for sure. We uh, um, we actually do live stream that sometimes. We'll hop on just randomly, and we'll put up a live stream of us playing Phasmophobia, and I get scared to death, even if we are in a group of four. So mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah, I'm fine that's a scary it. one. Yeah, so that's the uh, Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. There's um, anything else you guys want to touch on on this one? There was a whole lot going on there, and it was a longer longer episode for sure. 
I thought your opening ghost story was terrifying, to be honest with you. I was gripped from the beginning with that. Um, and yeah, I, think- I tried to I tried to connect it with like one of the actual stories that happened, which was obviously the nurse that had gone missing, got found on the right. stairs. So I was like, let me base the story around that. I like to, when I do create these opening stories, I like to base them around some sort of story that actually happened. That's kind of the way we've done all of them is we try to incorporate anything that we've heard of um, for, for the actual ghost stories to build around, like you said. Might as well just say what you said. Yes, thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so Dave, anything else you want to touch on? No, I just thought the um, the, the lobotomy side of this was was really crazy. Read that word again. Can't get away from it. <clears throat> Can't do it, yeah. Can't That's do why it. I just threw it out the window at the beginning. I'm like, we're so I'm low mess it up. on adjectives. So few adjectives. <laughs> we, we've thrown around bonkers, crazy. Bonkers, bananas. Wacky, yeah. So... Anyways, the Transalleghetti Lunatic Asylum, that is in Weston, West Virginia, W-E-S-T-O-N, not Western West Virginia. It might be Western West Virginia. I didn't look at it on the map, but that is Weston, West Virginia. I got a text saying that JFK's sister was lobotomized when she was in her teens, mm-hmm. ordered by her father. Yeah, that's, um, uh, is it Rosemary's Daughter or something like that? I think it was a movie based on it. Yeah, this was Rosemary's like the unspeakable. Baby. Yeah, Rosemary's Baby yeah. was, I think, not the same thing. Actually, I'm 100% sure that Rosemary's Baby was a different story. Might have been. Might be wrong about that. But this was like the unspeakable thing. Like they were like, okay, let's fix our crazy daughter who wasn't really crazy, but there, she was just a little bit, you know, she was rambunctious or whatever. And they gave her a lobotomy. It ruined her life. And I, I don't really know the history on that. I would, should have looked more into it. But that was uh, kept on the low because it was a politician. And that's how uh, those things go sometimes. So... Yeah, I don't know. There's a few success stories, but definitely not enough. Definitely more horror stories when it comes to lobotomies, for sure. Hmm. Do we want to get into some of our five-star reviews for the week? Yes, let's do it. All right, so the first one is from the name I Don't Want the Cam, which is weird, but... I don't want the what? The Cam, like camera, camera? I guess. Okay. All right. Or his name is Cameron. All right, everyone turn off your cameras while we read this review. Yes, they don't want it on. Uh, it's called Favorite Spooky Podcast. This podcast is so fun. I love the spooky story at the beginning, then the real history, and then y'all chatting about it later. Perfect setup. Done very well. Smiley face. So thank you, Cam. I'm just going to call you Cam. Um, we have one from Janine titled Spooky. I look forward to watching Hometown Ghost Stories every week. I find it to be interesting, educational, and full of history. The hosts are funny and smart. Well, yes. And hope to see more shows. Well, you can every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Or catch us on Apple iTunes. It's 100% gonna, my mom. Going to jump Thanks, in real mom. quick. Love um, you, mom. Rosemary's Baby is a 1968 American psychological horror film uh, that is based, that is based follows a young pregnant wife uh, who comes to suspect that her elderly neighbors are members of a satanic cult. So same no, thing. Not, same thing. not the same Nothing thing. to do with. Same thing. Nothing. Nothing to do with lobotomies. Okay. Very well. Uh, Patreons, uh, Jake V, Stephanie A, Seth Dave Sucks W, Captain McSlug, Sarah R. Thank you all for being Patreons. And we'll be back. We're going to have uh, the bonus content for this week. Is that going to be the haunted chair? Or do we have something else lined up before that? I just want to say I'm sorry, Captain McSlugs. I was going to read your five-star review, but clearly Jesse doesn't want me to. So, Nope. Not going to do it. All right. We all right. Read it, it then. Just do it. <laughs> just read it. I've been listening to this podcast from day one. Stunning production and storytelling. Phasmophobia live streams are hilarious. Captain McSlugs is very handsome with his VR headset. <laughs> I love that he didn't even need to try to hide that he was talking yeah. about himself. Right. His name is Captain McSlugs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's, us know that he's handsome. He's mostly handsome when he wears that VR headset. No, yes. but seriously, we have been getting, again, a lot more five-star reviews, and we really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone that has left a comment on a YouTube stream, whatever. Um, as you were getting into anyone that has jumped into the Patreon, we have side content every week that we have been releasing early for the Patreon members. And we are currently even doing some side content that is exclusively for Patreon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We also got a three star review from th- this week. So I hope that guy gets violent poltergeist attacks inside of his house. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically speaking. 
Well, he didn't leave a written review, so we can't read it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that'll do it for this week. I want to thank you all for hanging out. And uh, we'll be back next Tuesday, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, as we are every single week for episode 30 of Hometown Ghost. Actually, what, do, what is next week? What do we have? Oswego, New York. They got uh, Fort Ontario, which is haunted. There is a headless ghost, um, not on the fort, but also in Oswego. And there are several other hauntings. There are actually a lot more hauntings in this town than I had originally thought when I did my initial um, research into it. But I just keep finding more and more and more haunting stories. So I'm going to have a situation where I get to pick and choose my favorite ones. So, yeah. And, and this uh, one's he's, asking if it's, he's asking this, if the army base is haunted. Yeah, for yeah, it's um, it's an army all the way back to the uh, French and Indian War. It was burned down like four times. It was occupied by the British, occupied by the French, occupied by the Americans, and it was just lots and lots and lots of history there. And this was um, requested by a user. I mean, yep, a user, this was a, by a listener. So that we kind of dug into it, and I was like, "Oh man, this is super cool!" And then Dave kind of ran with it, and I'm super excited to hear it. Just real quick, because you did mention fire, and I, I remembered I wanted to talk about this real quick. There was a fire at this asylum, mm -hmm. as we're signing off here, but there was a fire at the asylum. Nobody died in the fire, which one of the patients actually said. Reason why is because when the fire alarm went off, everyone thought it was the dinner bowl. So everyone just filed out to go get dinner, and everyone was fine. So and nobody they, panicked. Nobody panicked. Just, that's yeah. how it always happens. <laughs> they were like, fire. time to eat, and they just, wow. they just filed out. So that's yeah, so. a... Kind of cool story. So, That's, that, dare I say, crazy. Oh, no. <laughs> this uh, guy gets it. All right, we're going to sign off. We'll see you guys next week. We appreciate you. Uh, we'll be back Friday for some side content. <laughs> Thank you. Make sure you guys The Love Automobile. <laughs> the Automobile. All right, we're out. We'll see you guys. Thanks for listening. I forgot to click the button, so we're going to talk for another second. Right, yeah. We're out. Yeah. Bye. Um, Hey guys, I'm Jesse Wilkins from Hometown Ghost Stories. I want to thank you so much for watching this episode. Uh, if you enjoyed it, make sure you hit subscribe, hit the notification bell so you can see when we go live again. Also, if you're interested, please consider becoming a supporter on Patreon. Uh, the link is in the description below. Lots of cool perks. You can get your name in the credits, customize videos, join us on the live stream. Uh, lots of cool stuff there. So head on over to Patreon, check out Hometown Ghost Stories. Make sure to follow us on Twitter, Twitch, Facebook. All the links are available below, and we'll see you guys next time for another episode of Hometown Ghost Stories.